Okay, good morning. Uh, thanks for, uh, for being here. Thanks to Yemed for uh, organizing this, uh, this event. And thanks to Giuseppe Provenzano for being uh, uh, with us. Today we have uh, this session whose t title is Sustainable Development, Education and Science Diplomacy, Challenges and Opportunities in the Euro-Mediterranean Region. Um, the issue is... Uh, Absolutely, absolutely urgent uh, and is one of the priority for, uh, for, uh, for the area. Um, I, I have the pleasure to, to present uh, Giuseppe Provenzano, who works uh, at uh, uh, Union for the Mediterranean. He's co-responsible for the Research and Innovation uh, uh, Unit and he has uh, an extensive uh, um, expertise and knowledge uh, on uh, the Euro Mediterranean area, especially on uh, uh, um, science diplomacy and the role of uh, uh, universities in the area, among uh, other other issues. So, without uh, an, any uh, um, delays, I will uh, pass the floor to Giuseppe. Thanks for being uh, with us. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure. The floor is yours. Thanks, Giuseppe. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's really a pleasure being here. And actually, uh, when we are at EMED, uh, us coming from the Union for the Mediterranean, we are basically at home uh, because this institution is uh, a bit the, the mind behind the things that we do. We need research, we need students, we need to work. And especially since I'm working personally in cooperation with universities, uh, uh, having an opportunity for talking with students which are supposed to know a bit about international relations and political science, it's a challenge because I cannot lie, cannot say yes, things which are not true because you are studying on this and it's also an important responsibility because presenting our activities, uh, since we are not as known as bigger frameworks such as the European Union, the African Union, it's always uh, an interesting thing to do. Uh, I guess this is for the slides, right? Uh, I understand that you are coming from master students and you have an understanding of political science a bit. Uh, how is the master called, if I may? The, ma the master is uh, Mudoi, master in uh, Organizaciones Internacionales ah. in, in, in uh, Diplomacia. Okay, so basically you are the future bosses uh, that I'm going to have when you are going to become ambassadors, when you are going to become politicians, leaders of parties, uh, and it's uh, so I'm, I'm speaking to an important audience uh, and specialist audience. This is great. Uh, usually, when I'm going to present a bit what we are doing, it's a bit difficult because maybe they're coming from engineering, but political scientist. I'm a political scientist myself. I studied. Uh, uh, international relations of the Middle East, uh, so I'm feeling uh, more at home. So I will allow myself to be a bit more technical because you are supposed to know some of the uh, terms I'm going to use. In very short, um, uh, here, this is not really moving, uh, I'm going to present a bit how it is working, the cooperation in the Euro-Mediterranean world, but this is an excuse. It is, it is an excuse for presenting two topics, two diplomacy subjects which are quite important and not only in the Euro-Mediterranean. Of course, I'm going to present you this case, but they are becoming global way of doing diplomacy, of doing international relations, doing cooperation. The first one, which is connected to everything which is science diplomacy, and the second one is innovation, education, and sustainability. Nowadays, when we are working uh, between countries, between parts of the region, uh, including the sustainability dimension, the scientific dimension, uh, the education is key for survival. Let us think, and uh, as this will be my only introductory example, the impact that Erasmus has had in all of our lives. Without Erasmus, there would not be Europe, dot. The feeling of being part, being European, has been pushed by the incredible success, success of Erasmus. So when we talk about education and diplomacy, when we talk about science cooperation and science diplomacy, this is the first thing you should pop to mind. It sounds very vague, but when you picture something that exists, it becomes clear why it is, it is important. And it is important because it's not countries talking, it's citizens, students engaging and creating the bridges 
in which we are going to build our future. And this is needed more than ever in our poor Mediterranean because links and bridges tend to be a bit more frail than they are in Europe. And this is why uh, I'm so passionate to talk about cooperation in education, cooperation in research, because you create links between universities, between students, and between people. So um, the main point on what I'm going to present here today is, of course, how it is cooperation uh, in the framework of the Union for the Mediterranean, the organization which I'm working with, but also a way in which 43 member states are interacting. And I'm going to focus on two priorities, education and research. Basically, the first one is more on scientific uh, cooperation or science diplomacy, which is a, a, a term a bit more a la mode at this moment. And the other is how education can contribute to sustainable development, or something that we call in the UFM the innovation employability nexus. Um, it seems that I'm crossing with this. So first, in brief, what is the Union for the Mediterranean? Do, do any of you have any idea? Did you study it? Is it the first time you hear about this? Can you raise the hand if you ever heard about the Union for the Mediterranean? This is more than what I expected. <laughs> I congratulate you. Uh, for putting this into perspective, because you're coming from uh, social sciences and politics, it's good to speak about the past as well. Uh, there is something called the Barcelona process, uh, which I'm not saying it here because I'm in Barcelona, but it's because where it all started. It was in 1995, it was coming from the Oslo uh, mood, let's say, when countries were starting to talk again. There was a lot of positivity. And for the first time, people said, yes, but Europeans, non-Europeans, we are a region, we are a Mediterranean region. Maybe we should start to put things into perspective. We should start talking about the existence of the possibility of having a Euro-Mediterranean region. So huge variety of people, but connected by something which is the Mediterranean, which in a way, even the, in the farthest countries, always connecting a bit our history, our culture, the way that we are. This has created the process which was a bit more intergovernmental. It was between countries. And then in this, in 2008, um, member states decided, OK, but we need something a bit more structural, because otherwise discussion remain discussion. We need an organization for doing this, a secretariat, which is the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, which has had highs and lows, like everything in the world, and especially in, the, in our region. But it was a way of creating a way of leaving aside the high politics and to talk about things which matter to the citizen. For instance, environment, for instance, water scarcity, women's rights, or the role of education and, uh, and research. This is not part of, it is not coming in a void. It's part of a community because the different parts of society needs to be reflected somehow. So we call it the Euro-Mediterranean community. Uh, which, is, which has, of course, a more civil society organization side, which is the, the Annalint, where there is a parliamentary assembly. So the parliaments of our 43 member states, they meet up in uh, working groups, working, for instance, on uh, women empowerment, and it's called the Parliamentary Assembly of the UFM. Um, there is the local authorities, which is Arlem, and then there is us, which, in a way, we represent the governments. Uh, we have 43 member states, and we are the only one which is putting together uh, such a wide and broad membership, let's put it this way. Uh, but how we are doing it? Basically, we have created our own mission. Okay, we will not solve the world, uh, but maybe we can enhance regional cooperation and dialogue, and we can create initiatives and projects that benefit everyone. So it's uh, quite a big uh, job to do already. But there is an evolution in the way that we work, is that it's not Europeans talking to the people coming from the south or the part prevailing on the other. Since the first time, since the first uh, moment in 2008, we said we need to work in a way that the north and the south, they have equal footing. The, we work together in a, in a certain way, equal weight, equal way of uh, pushing things, blocking things. So we have a co-presidency, 
We have the North, the European Union, and the South are selected for the time being, uh, Jordan. Our uh, ambassadors, they meet, they take decisions, so everyone is on board and we work together in this way. And then, for being concrete, we took six uh, topics, six areas in which we can work together. Uh, I'm not going to make you a list because otherwise we're going to, to fall asleep, but uh, you can read it already. Uh, there is from social affairs through employment, which is important in our region because it's one of the regions in the world where there is the highest level of youth unemployment. Uh, I'm coming from the south of Italy, so I know it. Uh, energy, climate, transport, but myself specifically, I'm working on higher education and research. How do we work? Because one thing is to say, we want to do this. Yes, but how do you translate this into practice? So we have created uh, a so-called methodology, the three Ps, which is political side, policy side, and then there is the project side. The first P is for uh, policy, no? So we have the ministers, they meet on a sector. Myself, I'm coming from research, so the ministries of universities and scientific research, they meet up and they say, we, in the next few years, we need to concentrate to work on water scarcity, on food security. We need to work on this. They give us a mandate. This is very important because we cannot work on whatever we want. We need to say to the member states, we are working specifically on this. Um, then we call the ministries, the people working in these ministries, which are working in international cooperations, and they say, okay, the ministers told us to do this. What can we do together? We sit down and we create um, ideas, initiatives, projects, and so on. And finally, we label, we do not fund, unfortunately, we, we select some projects and we give our political push for instance, uh, we have in Morocco uh, a Euro-Mediterranean University. We have another in Slovenia, which is being labeled by us and is supported by us politically. So the second point is that, but I mean, you can choose all the priorities in the world. Why are you choosing education and research? Why are we not choosing uh, something completely different, like uh, artificial intelligence? Why are we not working in IT uh, or whatever? Why it is so important to select this topic? And this has been selected since the first moment. In 1995, when they met for the Barcelona process, they already said, as ministers, scientific cooperation is a key for peace, it's a key for dialogue, it's a key for solving our issue together. But it sounds, no, when you first think about this, but it's, it's secondary, no? We have so many more urgent issues. Why have you selected this? And it's actually one of the best uh, way of working on solutions together. Because in the Mediterranean, we have a double set of challenges. From one side, the ones that are more connected to our environment, which is degrading fast. This region is impacted by climate change a lot. It's embattled by water scarcity, by pollution, plastic in the sea, energy scarcity, whatever. So we need to be innovative, to, to create new research solutions, to apply, to desalinize our water, a uh, very complex word. Uh, on the other hand, we have a vast potential. This is a very young region. I mean, in, in many countries, the people under 30 years old, it's dramatically high. But at the same time, a lot of them are unemployed. So the, this is the region which is, okay, we have one third of companies say we do not find the skills we want, and so we cannot hire them. Uh, there is a lot of need, which is people not studying, like you, and not working. But it is normal everywhere in the world, but there is here something which is even worse. We have the highest level of unemployment among graduates in the world, which is one quarter of the people, they go out of universities and they cannot find a job. Usually, the more you study, the, the easier it is to get a job. But in many countries, it's the opposite. The more you study, the more difficult it is because the economy cannot have the roles you're looking for. So there is a disconnect between what universities, education centers, training centers are offering and what the market is looking for. So, if we try to work on having curricula, for instance, on renewable energy, it's a way of addressing energy security, it's a way of addressing uh, unemployment. So we try to put together these two topics together because innovation and sustainability 
are inter intrinsically connected. If you go and check the sustainable development goals, many of them, they need to be solved, and they need to be solved through innovation, through new solutions, through education, by creating information in society, by creating new uh, roles in, in people getting out of university. So since the first moment, they said, OK, if we need to solve many issues in the Mediterranean, maybe we can start from education. Maybe we can start from uh, scientific research. Uh, and this brings us to this uh, topic of uh, science diplomacy, which is the first tool, the first solution I'm offering you, which in the Mediterranean, it's growing in importance, it's more functional, but this is something that you can use everywhere in the world, and in many parts of the world, it's advancing. Let's just think even cooperation with China, cooperation with the United States, cooperation with Africa, innovation and science is growing as a tool for cooperation. Why? First of all, because through science, you identify that we have common challenges. We have climate change, we have water scarcity, we have food security. We need to address it. Maybe if we pull the resources together, we can find a new way of raising crops, which is adapted to the fact that now temperatures are higher, there is less water. Catalonia knows it very well, that we need to adapt our way of doing agriculture. It's a way of joining our resources when we have small budgets, scarce resources, so uh, not, uh, we don't have infinite money for research. So maybe uh, we create a network of research centers coming from 10 countries, and they put together the money, and they find a new solution. And it's a way of asking everybody to chip in, so we, we avoid the tragedy of the commons. Uh, everyone is contributing to scientific research, so nobody is excluded from it, and nobody can say, well, I'm not part of the solution. It's the way of pushing. And the Mediterranean has created many interesting initiatives. For instance, there is a partnership for research and innovation, which is more than 500 million euros, specifically on food security. It's called the Prima Initiative. And the headquarters is here in Barcelona, by the way. So we put to every, all the countries, the EU, they put together money, and we, we try to find new ways of raising our crops, of saving water. If every, every country does it, it's not as important. If we do it together, we go far. And then the question would be, OK, but what is this science diplomacy you're talking about? Because uh, it's, it can be a bit of everything. You can put everything under this name. Uh, there are academic definitions, of course. Uh, here, it's, um, I've written the classical one that you can look around, which is science in diplomacy, which is when Science is providing help for negotiating. Diplomacy for science, uh, when you cannot do an agreement between two countries academically, then diplomacy can help you. We want to have an agreement between Spain and Morocco to uh, do a new research project. It's blocked. Diplomacy can help. And then there is science helping diplomacy, science for diplomacy. We have a very strong researcher network and so we have this improving diplomacy because our countries know each other. So there are many ways of doing it. Uh, but what are we doing as Union for the Mediterranean uh, in all of these possible ways uh, of doing science diplomacy? First of all, we have created uh, some roadmaps, some agendas where we decided together to, to, to work together. No? So we said climate change, renewable energy, and health. We have these as priorities where we are working together. We are promoting research on anything which is connected to sustainable, sustainability, to environment, to water scarcity. In general, we are always there. And then we are doing personally capacity building actions. So we're doing publications, we are doing trainings, we are doing conferences, we are inviting uh, diplomats and researchers to come together and talk about the water, food, and energy. We are, we are meeting together for talking about climate change in the Mediterranean. Uh, and this way, we are creating a community of people that they are coming from different countries. They have different jobs, but they have the same objective. They know each other, they and they create new ideas. So this is very uh, theoretical. So I wanted to make an example of how we work on uh, one topic, which is climate change. First of all, uh, we discovered by UFM has supported a group of experts on climate change uh, during the last few years for creating an assessment of 
the impact of climate change in the Mediterranean. So uh, if you have studied already how it works with the Paris Agreement and everything, you know that all the countries are doing an assessment of climate change in the country. But there was never an assessment of the impact of climate change in the Mediterranean as a region. So not what is the impact in Italy, in Greece, in, uh, in Turkey, in Israel. It's uh, the region, what's happening here. So we supported, uh, and of course they're all independent because science is supposed to be independent, no? otherwise it would be state-controlled research. So we gave them the flow, and by working together, they discovered some things which are not entirely nice, which is that we are completely about to be destroyed by climate change, which is not the best piece of information to hear at 1 p.m. before lunch. Uh, but the idea is that the Mediterranean is the second most impacted region in the world when it comes to climate change. The temperature are rising dramatically. The first one is in the Arctic, but so maybe here it's a bit more chaotic if we do not act fast for or against this issue. Because we, why? That is simply, if there is more water rise, rising, we have cities built in the coast. Let's think about huge cities such as Alexandria or Barcelona. What is the impact if we have like half a meter more of water? Uh, this is warming 20% faster than the global average. Picture this, it's already rising, and we are rising more than the rest of the world. We are getting 30% less of rainwater. We are on targeting one degree, 0.54. Basically, we left our scientists to do their job, and we discovered that it's bad. It's very bad. So we need to do something. Uh, we identified, okay, let's go into the specific. We created on research, innovation, and working group on climate change and uh, research and innovation, said, uh, can you identify the impacts? And they did the list. It is going to impact uh, agricultural, greenhouse, biodiversity, public health, marine ecosystem. We collect all these inputs. And this was coming from research which were based anywhere in the Mediterranean. So it, it's not easy to put together all these people, they require a lot of efforts. They need to talk across countries, share information. And we put together a series of problem areas. We identified the SDGs that were impacted by this roadmap on climate change and research and innovation that we were developing. And then we met at the level of ministries. So we asked uh, the ministries of scientific research, send us your uh, expert working in cooperation in the Mediterranean. We need to discuss something important, which is research and innovation and climate change. This is the draft that we prepared with scientists. What is your opinion? Let's discuss, let's debate. And they endorsed through this, the UFM platform on research and innovation. At, at technical level, we say, the ministries, they said, OK, this is something which the 43 member states can recognize. This is important on climate change. What is the next level? I told you before, we have three Ps. We have projects, we have policy, and then we have the political level. So we prepared for the ministers a set of technical roadmaps. You can see that the top, the one in blue, is about climate change. Why? Because we listened to the scientists, we talked with the ministries, and then we created a packet of actions that can be done. This is a roadmap on research and innovation. We created a document which is summarized, which is, on, of course, on our internet. And we said we need to work on climate change, on three roadmaps, on water scarcity, agricultural production, and biodiversity, because this is what the scientists, the experts, and the ministries are telling us. So it's very good. Uh, why? Because, and we started to detail a series of information that shows this is where we are going if we do not put research and innovation to this matter. Uh, agriculture is going to be impacted. There is less than 20% of water next year, 2025. There is this number of threatened species and so on. So they accepted and we went to a ministerial meeting where the ministers themselves, they said, okay, we agree with this topic. Uh, we agree that uh, this roadmap is very important and we give you the political blessing that we need to work into this topic. So this is for showing you, you know? so we start from researchers meeting, starting to discuss, and then bottom up, it goes to the ministries and then to the ministers themselves. The Union for the Mediterranean, since it's an organization which is doing, in a way, it is kind of creating the table where we work together at the end of the day, 
brings the opinion of researchers, of experts, and so on, goes to the political level, which is something which is not very easy in our region, but at least then we have a clear set of priorities. Yes, but priorities are priorities. We need to work on the implementation. We got the recognition of what we were doing, of course, but then we went to the implementation phase. Okay, we said, guys, we agree with uh, we agreed on some priorities. Now we need to work together. So we start preparing a series of activities. For instance, the European Commission has created the Mediterranean Initiative. So inside the, the big program of the European Union for Research and Innovation, which is called Horizon Europe, there are some research and innovation calls, which are like 300 million euros. Uh, which are specifically targeting the priorities which are coming from dialogue. So there is a pipeline, it's a bit sectorial, but which brings from identifying an issue, doing dialogue together, and doing activities together. And in a way, it's a way of creating uh, scientific cooperation, sharing an agenda between 43 member states, and then doing scientific diplomacy. So you see, we start from something which is very vague, which is theoretical, and then progressively we create an agenda and we do action, we do activities, and we do initiative. And you can apply actually this concept anywhere else in the world. You can decide that between the US and China, they decide to cooperate, for instance, on, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence, on chips. It's, it, this is, it's a tool. And in the Mediterranean, it's connected specifically to sustainability. Why? Because we analyzed at the beginning that the climate change was going to destroy us, so we decided this was our political priority. The second element, and uh, I don't know if I'm uh, more or less on time, uh, the second element in which I wanted to focus is more connected to everything which is education, innovation, and sustainability. So, in a way, education for sustainable development, if you want. Uh, why? Because as mentioned in the beginning, we have a double challenge in the Mediterranean. We have the, the, uh, the climate challenge, the sustainable challenge here. We have the degrading environment. On the other hand, we have a lot of unemployment, especially among youth. So we try to create this interconnection between the different parts of society, specifically on this topic, for improving employability and for improving innovation in our societies. Again, what is the way in which we've done it? We started by listening. So we did some interviews, we did some polls online, we did some meetings in which we tried to listen to everyone, to universities and so on, and said, what are your priorities when it comes to supporting the employability of young people through education? What is the role of universities? What, is, what are the role of research centers? How can, how can they talk together with the private sector? How can we, can we support careers? What is the role of government? What is the role of a company maybe that doesn't know how to engage with the university? How can a university adapt to a shifting uh, market? Because maybe we are designing now a, a training which will be useful in five years when you go out of engineering, but in this, maybe when you are going out of engineering, there will not be any need for this kind of professional uh, role. So the importance here is to start to create a bit more of dialogue between the different parts of society. And we, uh, through this, we selected a bit of topics, which were, for instance, industrial internships, working on digital skills, soft skills, but also on funding on research, entrepreneurial ecosystem. What is important here to take in mind is that we start by listening, we talk with the different parts of society which has something to say on the topic, and then based on their own voice, we start selecting on which the topics in which we should be working on. For instance, we did a public consultation on what could be a ministerial meeting, a ministerial declaration on the future of higher education, basically university education, and what popped out of this public consultation, which was open to everyone, was we need to green our education. Basically, we need to include more anything which is green skills, green curricula, into our uh, training system, into our educational system. What does it mean? For instance, uh, the, the EU, the Mediterranean, the, uh, they want to go for a green transition. How do you do a green transition if you don't have people that know how to do this? 
we need to green our uh, energy systems. Do you have enough engineers that know how to work with renewables? Do you have enough managers that know what sustainability means? Do we, uh, do we have enough people in the food sector that knows how to go towards green? You cannot just improvise this. This should be part of the education. And this is what university students, associations have told us. You need to work much more on integrating the sustainable development goals into education. And this was quite clear, and we internalized this request coming from the, the citizens. The second step was developing our approach to this, because there are many ways in which we can take these priorities that we can work on. We decided, okay, if we want to put education and sustainability together and try to push it towards the creation of careers, the creation of enterprises, giving, empowering our citizens, we need to create a vision. So we took one of the many possible models, which is the triple helix, which is uh, a very curious word, but it means basically putting together academia, governments, and business sector into a dialogue system. And then to connect civil society through this, a considering environment, which goes from three to five pillars of society. So we put all these pillars into a system of dialogue for trying to create uh, a common vision of education for young people, of research, and what we learn from all of this. Uh, we learn that we need to invest more in capacity building for the institutions which are working with young people, for instance, universities, for instance, research centers, that universities, uh, here I write HE, which means higher education, but anyhow, uh, is one of the key actors that needs to push against uh, unemployability, let's say, the inability of young people to find a job. They need to reflect much more on how to become more adapted to the needs of the market, but also how to uh, foresee and forecast what is the future of world. And if we include the green economy into this discussion about the future of education, there are huge opportunities, which can help us to achieve the green economy, the green transition, but also to include the socially all parts of society. So we shift from a green transition to a just transition, an inclusive transition. So what we learn all of this, we reflect on all of this, what have we we've been doing as Union for the Mediterranean? First of all, is we created some knowledge products, some studies. Uh, we need to speed up? Okay. Uh, some knowledge products which can be used by everyone uh, in, in society for trying to work more together. First of all, we create a handbook, we call it a manual for society, basically. We divided it specifically, we said this is a handbook for governments, academia, and business. You want to work with the other sector, it's very easy. You open this book, with, there are 11 chapters, and you can find ideas. And it's not saying we are not doing well enough. It's taking ideas coming from the Mediterranean. For instance, we discovered that in Tunisia there is a very good startup act. So there is a law for promoting startup. There are some universities in Morocco which are very good in connecting and doing innovation centers. There are international centers working on agriculture which are working with society. So we created 11 topics in which we say, OK, this is possible ways of working together across society. For instance, a very concrete idea that came out of it is industrial PhDs. So why are companies not working more with universities for creating a PhD which is shared across the two, the two entities, let's say. This is very popular in Northern Europe, not so much in other parts. Is, it, is this the solution to everything? No. But it's a start. Let's start talking about different possible solutions. Let's, let's be creative. Let's find ideas. Uh, our initiative has advanced. We call it the, the Innovation and Employability Initiative. Uh, we have created a study specifically on green innovation. So all the innovation that contributes to the green economy, to, to the sustainable development. And we are developing workshops on, for academia specifically on including green skills into the curricula of people. So very shortly, because otherwise I will be giving you too much information to digest, 
the study on green innovation, we went into specific countries. We took three pilot countries. Uh, in this case was Tunisia, Jordan, and Italy, because we are EU Mediterranean. We, uh, and we said, okay, what are your policies that exist for connecting education, research with the business market and artist policies pushing for the green economy? And we start to analyze, oh, yes, we have this uh, mobility of academic students in this country. Uh, yes, we have this program for recognizing the credits when you do research in a company. Uh, we have this reform going on for the, the patents that you do at university. There is a statute specifically for this. And we analyze a set of activities. Uh, we analyze the projects, the initiatives, very different countries. We learned a lot, but the important part was that this was done in uh, complete synergy with the ministries of universities and research. So it was not something done outside of the box, but it was done within the box, and in this way, learning together was the most useful part, because we discovered we, uh, across each other. We created a series of recommendations which are, yes, national, but also regional, to work more on this. And this picture was a bit what came out of the study. No? When we connect government, academia, and industry, there are these intersections which are clearer when you see about them. Because industry is the one offering research opportunities. University are the managers of knowledge. And governments, they have a set of policies and grants. When you start connecting all of this, you start moving in the direction that you want, which is having a Mediterranean which is more innovative, it's greener and more sustainable, but it's also offering real career opportunity to its citizens. And finally, on uh, green skills, we started developing uh, workshops specifically on some topics. For instance, we went to uh, we were hosted by our good friends in Siam uh, Saragossa, which is an institute working on uh, uh, agricultural knowledge at high level for the Mediterranean, and we invited the Chamber of Commerce of uh, Amman, the Chamber of Cor Commerce of Saragossa, uh, or university coming from Morocco, uh, um, employer association coming from Algeria. We, pr we brought all these people together, and we said, if we need to revolutionize the way that we do curricula, the way we do teaching in universities, the way we do research on food security. So what would you do? We brought some experts, they brought uh, topics, we, we work together, we develop case studies, and we try to give to this participant an idea on how to update, let's say, our curriculum specific on agriculture, on water scarcity, on everything connected to food security for including a new vision of what does it mean to have skills and to support the green transition. The, here you can, maybe you can spot me. I'm the guy in the middle, so I'm uh, very difficult to miss. Uh, and it was incredibly informative because the students that we brought, they were actually teaching us at the end of the day because they brought their own skills. Because uh, we had rectors coming, uh, people coming from faculties, people that were already doing plenty of this project. But we created a community of people that by talking to each other across the Mediterranean, they shared ideas and now they want to build on together. So this, what you discover when working in the Mediterranean, then we, you bring the people together and we talk about topics, then it's an explosion of ideas and goodwill to work together. So we want to replicate this on renewable energy. Uh, we are partnering now with, uh, with the Algerian Ministry of uh, uh, Universities and Scientific Research, and we want to repeat this model by bringing experts working on um, energy companies, but also universities and faculties which are working on this, engineering faculties in this case, Chamber of Commerce's government to discuss if we want to realize a green transition in the energy sector in the Mediterranean, how can we make the uh, universities and research centers parts of it? There is no clear solution, but it is that when we put together the dialogue actors, then good thing happens. And finally, for, uh, for closing, is that since we try also to always to work on this topic on green innovation, green skills, we, uh, we try to work also with FAO, for instance, and with other actors, for bringing the topic of education and science diplomacy 
into food security, even at institutional level. So we have created a platform called the Sustainable Food System Mediterranean Platform. And I wanted to include this because it's also maybe useful for you. We have created a, a web page full of digital tools with information, with pamphlet, with uh, webinars that we have done on specific topic, for instance, on marine food and what is the future of this, what is the future of including local authorities. And uh, I hope that this was uh, interesting enough. I know it was a lot of information. Uh, but thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Giuseppe. And congratulations for, uh, for, uh, for your presentation and for, for being uh, on time. So this allows us to, to, to have some uh, some more time for uh, for the debate. Uh, we have been asked to close the session at uh, quarter to two. Uh, I would leave the floor uh, to students if they want to react, if you have questions, comments, doubts. Yes, thanks. Uh, just I'll wait, wait for the micro because I think that we are on streaming. So in order to have your voice, thanks. Thanks a lot for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I was actually wondering, but I, I can't help but notice the diversity of the countries that make up the, yeah, the Mediterranean Union. So I wanted to ask you, how do you like manage to get that homogeneity in the projects, like on the selection of them? Because we know that Italy's problem may be not the same as one of the southern countries. So how do you manage to do that in the conversations in the Secretariat? That's an excellent question, to be honest. Uh, well, the first, the, the first thing we need to keep into consideration is that we're not trying to homogenize anybody. Everybody is retaining their own diversity, their own opinion, their own values. But we are finding common topics on which we have a common interest. Because if we're talking about the fact that uh, we need to do a green transition in terms of energy, if we have less fish in our water, this is an issue which affects Italy and affects Morocco, because if we are overfishing, if we are putting too much plastic in our sea, then we're not discussing politics here. We're discussing that there is too much plastic in our sea. If we're discussing that there is too much youth unemployment, we're not discussing the different, okay, we have different systems. Can we share ideas? Can we find idea, solutions together? So our methodology is very clear. We focus on concrete topics in which the minister said we agree on this. This is why I showed that there is a very complex system for getting to an agreement between the different ministers because once we get there, we can start to work on it because we have the agreement of 43 member states. We selected climate change. Do you all agree? Yes. Do you agree that climate change for us means working on food security? Yes. Thank you. And then we can start doing it. But you, once you start seeing these countries, you need to realize that they have much more in common in terms of challenges than what, what is uh, evident. Drought is something uh, which is hitting very hard Spain, but in the South Mediterranean, they know it since centuries, and now it's eating even North Italy. Now it's creating uh, on the opposite, where you have too much water in, uh, in Germany, and then you have fires in Greece last year, no? It's all interconnected. <laughs> Yes, thank you for such an interesting talk. I would also be uh, interested in knowing what well, the track record of the organization is specifically because the, this kind of institution uh, has a, the power to attract new members and also the, uh, the, uh, the interest of the existing members depending on its performance and what it can bring to the table and what it can progressively contribute to the general sphere to which it is dedicated. My question would be, what's the greatest achievement the Union for the Mediterranean has achieved in the past uh, 20, 30 years? What would be the sort of magnetic uh, feat or achievement that you would cite uh, to recognize the, the, uh, the institution's power uh, to deliver something to its members? Thank you. Well, the first, uh, my first answer would be I will tell you in 10 years because we are only 15 years old as an organization. Uh, yeah. But uh, indeed, uh, you open a bit of a philosophical question, which is what is the impact of dialogue? Because of course, uh, you, you cannot measure what is the impact of putting together 
20 diplomats for talking about water, but maybe you can see what is creating on the ground. On the ground, I can tell you that, for instance, we launched last year during the COP, uh, the Conference of Parties for Climate Change, but of course you know it because you're doing uh, diplomacy. Uh, we launch an initiative uh, which is specifically on the blue economy and investment in the Mediterranean and we managed to bring together the UFM of course it's only one partner but it was the political dialogue partner so to say where we have investment banks such as the European Investment Bank or the European Reconstruction and Development Bank EBRD which are coming in to finance and fund projects on the so-called blue economy which is green economy applied to the sea in the Mediterranean, and we were instrumental in this discussion, in calling the member states, in convincing actors, in putting our credibility on it. We, our, uh, like we have partners and sister organizations, I mentioned before the Prima Partnership, which is our, one of our best friends, so to say, which is located very close to us, and this is uh, after the, currently I said it's more than half a million euros, I think it's like seven uh, million euros, in research innovation on food security. Then there are all small projects like Plastic Busters, which is working on plastic in the sea. It's not managed by us. I will not say this is what we are doing. But we are, I'm saying that dialogue is creating some follow-ups. And if you don't create a condition for this, then maybe actions will not get there or will not get there so quickly. I hope this answers somehow. Thank you, Giuseppe. Another question, please. Hello, yeah, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, so you spoke about the handbook for governments, academia, involving universities and businesses, which is industries. But this is quite a, a privileged group, in my opinion. I think to go to university is quite a big privilege. So my, uh, my question is, how would you look to mobilize societies who don't have access to this sort of level of academ academic knowledge? Thank you. Uh, it's true that, uh, well, uh, university, not everyone has access to it, but it's also not, not something that we can really generalize because in many countries, uh, the public university system is quite open and quite welcoming to everyone. In other countries, it's more privatized. For instance, the, the, the system, just thinking out of my mind, that in Indonesia is almost entirely public, in Lebanon is almost entirely private, so you have a lot of differences. It's true that uh, we tried in the past to work also on vocational education and training. Uh, we have a project which is putting together, for instance, the, the so-called schools of the second opportunity, the second chance, which is for students that did not manage to have a, a linear uh, academic career, but they are offered a second chance by specific vocational education trainings. It's called the med Ense because new chance, uh, and it's working quite well in many countries. But we also need to keep in mind that universities, it's not always so privileged because in many, people, in many cases, it's also uh, a social lift. The old function of university was to take, uh, even, even in Italian constitution, we say that uh, everyone who is capable should have access to education because it's a way of giving it to everyone an equal footing to, to life. Of course, this not happens everywhere. But there is, on the other hand, I, I reverse the point, is that in the Mediterranean, we have 25% of graduate unemployment. So this is not so privileged when you look around this. And we also try to develop some publication where they put together vocational education and training and academic trainings for trying to find some middle ground, which is often based on topics such as micro-credentials, no? Some courses specifically you can attend add, if you have or you don't have maybe a degree which is specific and should empower you by giving you some specific skills needed by the market at the point. But the question is absolutely open. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the topic of science diplomacy. Um, how does the UFM work with other actors in the ecosystem, like here in Barcelona or Catalonia, especially to avoid duplication of efforts because it's a quite a diversified topic? 
Thank you. Do you have two hours? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad for the question because actually uh, we are not scientists at the UFM. So this is the first point to take into consideration. So we are not w trying to steal the show from research centers. I, I mean, I'm sitting in one at this moment. So uh, universities, we try to federate the efforts. What was missing in the Mediterranean was to have a common space where everyone contributing to science diplomacy could come, join, and then try to create a network. So this is specifically what we're, what we're trying to avoid. We're creating spaces where, ah, but you're also working on climate change. Uh, where are you based? Oh, can, can our institution create? So last year, we did the first Euro-Mediterranean conference on science diplomacy. Uh, I'm quite proud to say that UFM managed to bring, uh, I think, 23 uh, member states coming. We even had like Libyan ambassadors, we had uh, Moroccan scientists, we have everybody coming to the table and then we sat down and we discussed some concrete topics. So this is the way in which you are doing. We create a space where everybody can come, can contribute, and then you create a hub of people that can push <coughs> in this, in, in, together in this direction. It's clear for climate change, uh, the MEDEC group, it's an open group, I mean, you, you can join. If you're an expert on something, they are looking for an expert, you send uh, an application. If your uh, scientific credentials are fine, you are selected, you start working on it. So we uh, are the only organization which has 43 member states at the <coughs> governmental level in the Mediterranean. So our role here is to avoid duplication, but instead, we take that application, we put it together, we weld it together, it's, it's bigger at the end of the day. Not so easy, eh? Yeah, a couple of questions more. We have the last 10 minutes. We are great with the respect of time. Thanks, Giuseppe, <laughs> it's not easy. Okay, meanwhile, you are thinking the last two questions, just a, a short reflection that I would share with you, uh, has from, from SEI, uh, as you know, SEI is, uh, is a, a, a consortium uh, between the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the University of Barcelona, and uh, Fundación La Caixa, so we have among the uh, three of our two partners, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the uh, uh, University, so we are, we are very committed to diplomacy, the standard form of diplomacy, but uh, in the last years uh, pretty, pretty interested and involved in the new forms of diplomacy, no? uh, cultural, science diplomacy, public diplomacy, and that could uh, 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 keep on going uh, for, with many other uh, uh, adjectives. Um, regarding uh, uh, science diplomacy, if you, if you, if you can, I'm, I, I'm interested in asking you regarding the behind the scene uh, uh, relation among uh, scientific and diplomats. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, until uh, <laughs> the point that you can, but do you really, from your experience, you have a vast experience by meeting now with uh, uh, both sides. Uh, what, what do you think is that, the, what are the dynamics between two, these two groups that sometimes one might my, 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 my have the feeling that they speak two different languages, no? uh, so diplomats from one side and scientific from, uh, from the other. And here you are telling us and we are, we are collecting evidence of the uh, synergies and the advantages that uh, we, can, uh, we can have as a citizen no? from, uh, from, the, from uh, the collaboration among the two sides. Yeah. Well, uh, it's an interesting question to hear specifically uh, in, this, in this country because uh, I've been uh, here. I will change my hat from the UFM and uh, take my other hat because I've been selected as an expert uh, by the European Union to work on science diplomacy. In, uh, specifically, in, uh, in this moment, there are some working groups that are working on some aspect on it. But I have to say that. Uh, in, in Spain, this concept of uh, science diplomacy is quite advanced when it comes to the average of the global count. For instance, in, during the Spanish presidency in the December, since I'm talking to future diplomats, hopefully, uh, there was the first European science diplomacy conference in Madrid, where we had a Mediterranean session specifically on this, so it's growing. 
There is a perception which is growing a lot, and Spain has been a bit of a trailblazer, opening the way for, for this kind of conception. It's true that in many cases, diplomats are not entirely aware of what does it mean this, but this is why there is this big push coming from like European unions, but also the US is, is doing it a lot uh, for trying to increase the, the understanding of the potential of this tool. It's also what is called in technical uh, jargon, uh, a track to diplomacy can be a way there are outside of the Mediterranean many instances where this was quite beneficial and it was quite useful because when there is a hard issue in which we would like to agree on something very complex, let's take climate change, no, the negotiation, the UN level, then the way out is saying, why don't we let our people talk, our people being the scientists, because they, they can talk, I mean, if you have data in front of you, Science, it's a neutral language. If it's neutral, it's not biased against you. I mean, if, if the facts are against you, then maybe uh, you, are, you should step aside because you are getting in the way of facts. So in this way, you can find always a solution because it's neutral, it's not against you. You can find a technical way of discussing it. And science can help a lot. It's a way of lowering the political tension is working on solution. More and more, in many embassies, there are scientific attaché, which are working on this. Uh, in the European Union, they, they have a, a, they are some professional uh, uh, figures doing that. It's still, for becoming a system, is still being uh, at experimental <coughs> level. But compared to five years ago, I'm seeing a trend up because there is a huge potential behind this, and. Diplomats and scientists are starting, at least some of them, to develop an understanding, if not a common language. It's, uh, it's not so easy, but it's incredibly interesting to see it happen. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that we have time. The micro, please. No? Do you have, did you have a question? No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do we have some more questions? I think it was information overload. <laughs> okay, the last one, we will close with your question, please. Yes, Elisabeth, we have the last, thanks. Yes, if there's time for a follow-up, uh, your initial response was actually very interesting when you mentioned there was a kind of a philosophical or methodological question how we can begin to measure an, uh, an organization's impact, so to speak. Uh, as you are on the front line of this organization's activity, my question would be, what's your take on that very question? Uh, how do you think we can approach the, uh, uh, you know, the question of how to evaluate an organization's performance and how we can use that, of course, to improve it, to ameliorate it, to expand it, and so on? What's your particular take on that question? Well, my particular take on this is that uh, dialogue, since it's not something that you can put on a scale and wagon, it's goodwill and good faith, meaning that if you use dialogue for going to do concrete things, then uh, it's, uh, it's indispensable. Because if you use uh, cooperation and dialogue for opening new ways for creating cooperation across universities that before did not exist, if you create mobility programs, for instance, of two universities that before did not talk, Thanks to dialogue, now we have 10 students going here and 10 students going there. This is an achievement. If you create a study center for water, if you create a research initiative specifically for food security, if you push countries to talk about women empowerment and youth empowerment, uh, then I, I would say this is a way of measuring impact and success. Thank you so much. So we can uh, we can close uh, the session. Uh, many thanks uh, to Giuseppe for sharing with us his time and his expertise. And uh, see, I'll see you very 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 soon in class. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.